Hi, I'm Terry Tomlin. In this series, we take a journey inside the Florida Aquarium to join wildlife experts, educators, and students just like you on a mission to entertain and educate while inspiring stewardship for the natural environment. Together, using science and research, we'll increase our knowledge and expose some myths by venturing inside the fascinating world of sharks, sea turtles, oysters, fishes of the wetlands, and marine mammals. These species all help inspire us to protect and conserve the world's priceless marine animals and their environments. So let's take the plunge on a learning adventure that explores these amazing wonders of our undersea world. This is the Florida Aquarium's Tanks to the Ocean, an educational web series brought to you by the Guy Harvey Ocean Foundation. A variety of wetland habitats are found across the state of Florida. They support an abundance of wildlife, from birds to reptiles and many species of fish, which depend on these habitats for their survival. Fish play a vital role in Florida's economy. The state is often referred to as the fishing capital of the world, attracting recreational anglers from around the globe. This episode explores how wetlands and the fish that thrive within them support fisheries found inside and outside of wetland ecosystems. We'll also learn what we can do to help ensure that wetlands continue to support an abundance of life for future generations. and I'm an exhibit educator here at the Florida Aquarium where I'm talking to you from our wetlands trail. Now I'm sure you're wondering, what is a wetland? Well, wetlands are transition zones between terrestrial and aquatic environments and they are frequently or constantly filled with water. They can also be transition zones between saltwater and freshwater. Some of the fish species found in these ecosystems can even swim between freshwater and saltwater. Wetlands provide essential food, shelter, and nursery ground for fish from a variety of aquatic environments. There are many different wetland ecosystems here in the state of Florida. These can include cypress swamps, riparian wetlands, freshwater marshes, saltwater marshes or tidal marshes, and mangrove forests. Fish found living in these wetlands can include gar, gold killifish, sheep's head minnow, sheep's head, redfish, snook, and many other different fish species. Now, some of these fish, such as the gulf killifish and sheep's head minnow, are considered bait fish, which are commonly found in mangrove forests. Here we are now in a mangrove forest. There are three types of mangroves here in the state of Florida. These include the red mangrove, white mangrove, and black mangrove. Now, the mangroves you see here behind me are red mangroves. They're found closest in and around the water. They're the most salt tolerant of the mangrove species. Further back behind red mangroves, you'll find black mangroves. And then further back inland, you'll find white mangroves. White mangroves are the least salt tolerant of the mangrove species. Now, you heard me earlier talking about bait fish, so I'm sure you've been wondering, what is a bait fish? Well, bait fish are typically smaller fish, which are a food source for larger fish. Bait fish can be found seeking shelter in mangrove roots. While seeking shelter, these bait fish become a food source for larger fish, such as snook and redfish. They can also provide food for other fish found within these mangrove forests and other wetland ecosystems, as well as fish outside of wetland ecosystems. Many ocean-dwelling fish, such as lemon sharks and barracuda, depend on wetlands for their survival. Both lemon sharks and barracuda use wetlands as nursery grounds. The roots of the mangroves provide shelter and protection for these small fish, and the bait fish that live within them provide an excellent food source. Now we've talked a lot about wetlands and the fish that inhabit them, but wetlands also act as a filter system for many other ecosystems. Redfish, they can make drumming sounds by rubbing their muscles against their inflated air bladder. Hi, my name is Haley. I'm a biologist at the Florida Aquarium. The flow of water through a wetlands is really important for water quality. When water flows through a wetlands, it has to go through a lot of vegetation. This vegetation helps slow down the water flow, trapping sediment and particles and laying them at the bottom of the wetlands floor. Plants are able to absorb a lot of nutrients through their roots because of this. 
This process enables a lot of pollutants and waste products to be trapped in the wetlands. The loss of wetlands can lead to pollution, not just inside the wetlands, but also in surrounding ecosystems. An example of this would be pollution from the Everglades affecting coral reefs in the Florida Bay. This also affects fish, not just inside the wetlands, but also outside of the wetlands. Big game fish like red drum, snook, and bait fish like mullet are also on decline due to pollution and being overfished. Another way to support healthy fisheries is to become a responsible fisherman. Fishing can be a lot of fun. Whether you're saltwater fishing or freshwater fishing, it is important that you're responsible. Using some of these tips can also help keep our fish stocks healthy. Now, if you plan on keeping your catch, remember to make sure you follow the regulations posted for that fish. Don't take fish that are out of the regulated size range, don't take more than the catch or bag limit, and don't take fish that are out of season. Catch and release fishing is another great way to enjoy the sport of fishing and very important to maintaining healthy fish stocks and populations. When targeting smaller fish, such as the redfish, snook, or sheep's head that you see next to me, you want to make sure you're using light tackle, such as a light rod, smaller hooks, and a lighter pound line. When fishing for larger sized fish, such as sharks or tarpon, you want to use heavy tackle. Using the proper tackle reduces the amount of time you have a fish on the line. This is important for the health of the fish, especially when targeting larger species that you plan on releasing. The second thing I'd like to talk to you about is the use of circle hooks. In my hand, I have two very large hooks. Now when you go fishing, you'll probably be using smaller hooks. And this hand is a J hook. You can see at the tip, it's pointed straight up. And this hand is a circle hook. If you look at its tip, it's pointed towards the shank. Use of circle hooks is very important because the circle hook is curved so that it doesn't internally hook the fish. It allows for a higher survival rate of the fish when you catch and release. Now, if you're using a circle hook, when the fish takes the bait, you simply just let it take the bait and then start reeling in. You don't have to worry about jerking the rod and setting the hook. The next thing I'd like to talk to you about is releasing your catch. How you release the fish is really important to its survival. Keeping the fish in the water is the best way to release a fish. If you decide to pull it into a boat, bring it on land, or take a photo with your fish, then make sure you properly hold the fish and quickly get it back into the water. Holding a larger fish vertically like this can damage the fish's spine. So it's important to always hold your fish horizontally with both hands. But you wanna avoid the gills, and you also wanna avoid the mouth, as some fish have a lot of teeth. You want to avoid the fins too because they also have spines. Once you have your fish in place and you're ready to remove the hook, you want to do it as quickly as possible because it's important to get the fish back into the water. Once the fish is in the water, you want to hold it so that it's facing the current and is able to get oxygen over its gills. Once the fish is ready to go, it's going to give a nice strong kick with its tail and you can remove your hands. Make sure you avoid those fins and the spines. Another way we can help reduce pressures on fisheries is through aquaculture. To learn more about what aquaculture is, we're gonna visit with the students at the Canterbury School of Florida. Sheephead minnow, these fish can survive in water that is severely deprived of oxygen by gulping in air from the surface. Hi, I'm Brett and we're here at Canterbury School of Florida and I'm sure you're wondering what aquaculture is. Aquaculture is another word for fish farming. It is a practice of raising fish for private or commercial use. Farms have vats or large pools of water to raise hundreds to thousands of fish. These fish then can be sold as ornamentals or used in various products like fertilizers, supplements, additives, pet foods, fish foods, or for human consumption. Hi, I'm Maria and I'm a student here at Canterbury School of Florida. Aquaculture can be helpful by reducing the pressures that wild fish stocks face. Instead of taking thousands to millions of fish from the ocean each year, these fish can be hatched, raised, and harvested, or set aside for breeding. Having these aquacultured or farm fish available can help reduce the amount of fish taken from the wild. Aquacultured sport and game fish, such as red drum, can also be used to help replenish wild stocks here in the state of Florida. Hi, my name is Kyler, and I'm at Canterbury School, Florida. This redfish aquaculture product at the Canterbury School helps to educate us 
about the Tampa Bay ecosystem and how hands-on restoration efforts have a positive impact on the bay and help restore habitat. A custom salt marsh grass, Spartina alterniflora, nursery and natural aquaculture system has been developed and maintained to educate us about native species and responsible environmental stewardship. Hi, my name is Connor and I'm in fifth grade here at Canterbury School of Florida. In my science class, we are learning to maintain the aquaculture system. We test water quality, measure fish growth, length, weight, and feeding behaviors. We also learn about animal husbandry through feeding and cleaning tanks. She said they have three kinds of teeth, incisors, molars, and grinders. These teeth are perfect for eating their favorite foods, which include crabs, oysters, clams, scallops, and barnacles. Hi, I'm Debbie, and I'm with the Education Department here at the Florida Aquarium. Now, I'm sure you agree with me that sea life is amazing. Now, seafood can actually be a really good choice for us to eat, too. It's a really good source of protein, vitamins, and minerals. It's actually a pretty healthy option. The important thing, though, is to always make sure that when you eat seafood, you're eating sustainable seafood. Now, what does sustainable seafood actually mean? It may be because it's from an aquaculture program, and it's not even being fished out of our oceans. It could also mean that it was fished responsibly, following all the appropriate guidelines and regulations. The most important thing to remember, though, is that for all the different reasons that come together, scientists and decision makers said, it's okay for us to eat this species right now. Now, this might seem a little bit overwhelming because there are thousands of species of fish out there in our waters, and that's before we even start thinking about crabs and lobsters and other invertebrates. But you have some help. There are some great resources like the Guy Harvey Ocean Foundation Seafood Guide. It can help you make decisions about your sustainable seafood. And perhaps one of the most important things you can do when you're at a supermarket or perhaps in a restaurant is ask, is this a sustainable choice? It's important to be informed, but it's also important to let your supermarket and restaurant know that you care. And by making a small choice, like choosing sustainable seafood, you could be making a big difference for tomorrow's oceans. In fishing, we're using what is still a wild resource. Most of our food comes from you know, farming, and we have tamed through um, many methods, and we use genetics and so on to um, get the best yield out of the best crops and the best animals. Um, but for fishing and wild fisheries, we're still tapping what is called a wild resource. And we depend on their ability to reproduce and replace themselves after our extraction to maintain the sustainability. And so the management of the extraction, definitely not of the, the reproductive rate of these animals, but the management of the rate of extraction is what we have failed to do well. Wherever you're going to involve human beings in extraction of some natural resource, whether it's, it's a mineral or a living or whatever kind of resource, um, there has to be some sort of plan for long-term extraction. And the plan has to include uh, generational use of that resource. So if you're looking for the, for the resource to replace itself, as fisheries or, or um, terrestrial resources can do and must do, and like a mineral resource that is finite, um, you're going to have to understand about the natural history of that resource. And so you've got to learn about it through research work before you start exploiting it. It's as simple as that. The Natural Aquaculture System supports Red Drum, on loan from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. The system demonstrates the ability of salt marsh grass and wetlands to act as natural filters. Hi, I'm Tristan, and I'm from the Education Department here at the Florida Aquarium. And I hear you guys have been on a great exploration learning about fishes of the wetlands. So I just wanted to take a little bit of time to kind of bring all that information together for you. So I thought, since we're in the state of Florida, that you could simply take your hand and represent the state. This could be the panhandle all the way down to off the fingertips being the Florida Keys. Now, if you think about Florida, it's a really important environment for a lot of animals. And we also have some really large wetland areas about right here on your hand. You can consider this the Florida Everglades. So if we took some water and started right here at the border of Florida and Georgia, Let's find out what will happen. So if we put a few little drops here, you'll notice that those drops are gonna run down, probably stop in Lake Okeechobee for a little while before running down into the Florida Everglades. 
Now all of the habitat around there, all of those plants are really important in filtering out any harmful chemicals, pollutants, and keeping the water really healthy for the animals. It also will filter it before it enters the ocean, which is on three sides of our state. So what can you do to help the wetlands fishes? Well, there's a couple of easy things. Anytime you see these little guys floating around, all you have to do is take them and stick them a couple of inches into the ground, and hopefully one day they'll grow into one of those really important red mangrove trees that you see, providing habitat for a lot of different animals. The next time that you're out fishing, make sure you're following proper fishing regulations. Dispose of your fishing line correctly. Also make sure that you are following the size limits the types of fish that you're allowed to catch, and how many you're allowed to have. Also, if you remember from earlier, we talked about sustainable seafood. Anytime you go to a restaurant and you're interested in fish or other seafood choices, ask questions. Find out where the seafood is coming from. That way, that will encourage restaurants to get more information and background on where their food comes from. So thank you guys so much for joining us today. We hope to see you soon on our wetlands trail here at the Florida Aquarium. This series is presented by the Florida Aquarium with generous support from the Guy Harvey Ocean Foundation. We thank you for watching. For more information or to donate, please visit us in downtown Tampa or online.